Welcome to Bristol Community <laughs> College. I'm Laura Douglas, President, and I want to welcome you to our first annual Mosaic. Uh, that stands for Multicultural Opportunities Serving Area Industries and the Community. But a great acronym, right? Mosaic. It's a chance for us to come together and to learn more about supporting diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion and belonging, uh, not just in our workplace, but also in our community. So I'd like to get started by asking Judy Urquhart, our Chief Development Officer here at Bristol Community College, to read our land acknowledgement statement. Judy. Thank you, President Douglas. Bristol Community College acknowledges that the locations on which we teach, learn, and connect are situated on the ancestral territory of the Wampanoag Tribal Nation, who has lived here for millennia, protecting and stewarding the land and waterways well before the arrival of colonial settlers just over 400 years ago. We support your efforts to learn more about the Wampanoag people and all of our indigenous neighbors. As an engaged institution of higher education, we commit to hiring practices, programs, and culturally accurate curricula that uplift indigenous cultures and voices in our communities. Thank you. So let's get uh, right to the panel, and I'm going to first introduce Melanie Cluley. Melanie is a highly experienced human resources professional with over 25 years of expertise across various industries. She currently serves as the Director for Organizational Culture and Eng Engagement, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Chair and ADA Coordinator at South Coast Health. She will discuss how to leverage external resources and partnerships to enhance our DEI work, emphasizing the value of collaborating with diverse stakeholders. Next up, we have Emmanuel Echevarria. He's a Bristol Community College employee. He's our Chief uh, HR Officer and Title IX and Equity Compliance Officer. Emmanuel will offer his expertise on Title IX, workplace equity, organizational compliance, uh, by highlighting the importance of creating a culture that values diversity and equity. Gail Fords uh, is the longstanding executive director of the YWCA of Southeastern Massachusetts. She's been a steadfast advocate for diversity and inclusion for over three decades. Gail is a board member of the One South Coast Chamber and vice chair of the Diversity, Equity, and, Conc and Inclusion Committee. Gail will provide some in insights on how she's driven social change as an advocate for racial justice, gender equality, and economic d empowerment. Ross Hooley, hi Ross, is the coordinator of Macy, Massachusetts Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Initiative at Bristol Community College. He's been in that role since 2019, and he leads an initiative empowering students with developmental disabilities and autism, fostering their integration uh, into college life. He can discuss the importance of providing inclusive education and job training programs that meet the specific needs of our neurodiverse individuals. And Helena Moranta, hello Helena, she is the first Vice President, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Bay Coast Bank. She will share her commitment to fostering inclusive workplaces, including insights on implementing effective diversity and inclusion policies, building diverse teams, and empowering underrepresented individuals in the business community. And last but not least, Artie Pacheco. Artie is an esteemed insurance professional at the New York Life Insurance Company and is deeply committed to diversity and community leadership. Serving on the board of directors as an ambassador for small businesses and DEI committees at the One South Coast Chamber, Artie also co-chairs a DEI committee at the Fall River Rotary Club. Artie and I are in the same Rotary Club, so I'm very honored to have known him that way, her that way. She will discuss how a business can create a welcoming and inclusive environment that provides comfort and belonging for all its customers and employees. So now let's begin and uh, we'll start off uh, with a question to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, how should businesses approach prioritization of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives? And how do you prioritize DEIB initiatives at your organization? 
Thank you, President Douglas. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here speaking to all of you. Uh, one of the ways that we can all prioritize, whether our business is public, a nonprofit, or a for-profit entity, is by thinking about what are the needs of our employee constituencies. What, uh, what DEIB-related initiatives are they looking for us to achieve? And also, what are their priorities? Our workforces are relying on their leadership in making sure that we establish a safe, productive, and effective workplace to help them succeed and to help us meet our, our business goals. And so I would suggest engaging employees, surveying employees, engaging employee resource groups or employee affinity groups and understanding what are their priorities in the workplace, and then prioritizing things that are tangible. And when I say tangible, I don't just mean performative things that people can see like a celebration or a cultural event. I mean things that are really related to the impact that employees want to see from their employers. Pay equity is a really important initiative to take on if you're serious about DEIB work. Recruitment strategies that really help not just foster diversity, but create inclusion in your onboarding process and your pre-employment processes that attract people from diverse backgrounds to coming to your organization. And then thinking about the three cycles of the employee or the three components of the employee life cycle, excuse me, pre-employment, your recruitment strategies, where you look for candidates, what goals or metrics are you tracking in, in your recruitment processes, your employment component of the, of the life cycle of an employee. How are you treating your employees? What culture are you bringing them into? How regularly do you engage them? How do you encourage them to innovate, take risks, and express vulnerability in the workplace? How do you promote them? How do you compensate them? How do you invest in their professional development? And then the post-employment component of the, of the life cycle, which is really critical. This is where a lot of employees will either find success or not. It's how do you transfer knowledge when employees are vacating a position? What pipelines do you have to ensure that your employees can continue moving up? And even if they move out, how do you retain their institutional knowledge? Here at Bristol, these are the things that our employees are telling us to prioritize, and therefore they've become part of our, part of our strategic plan. Right? Um, it also helps to work for an institution where inclusivity and, and inclusion is a core value, where equity and accessibility are part of our mission and vision. And therefore, all of those things allow us to have the appropriate level of autonomy and authority to really act on those things. One of the, one of the most critical things I think uh, a DEIB function or an HR function can do is partner with the finance department, right? We all know we invest in the things that are most important to us. So that integration between especially HR and finance, at least in my world, is really critical to ensure that you can meet all of your objectives. Thank you. Thank you for pre providing that wide framework. So now we're going to drill down a little bit uh, to Melanie and say, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you create a culture of belonging that is really tangible to the employee? Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm really appreciative, not only to uh, serve on the panel, but also to get to know all of the DEI professionals that I just met recently that I'm sure we'll be able to partner with in the future as well. I completely agree with everything you said, and I think looking at it from an HR perspective, when you're really looking at it as broadly as possible, it's really important. So some of the things that we've invested in at South Coast Health is things like employee resource groups. Do our employees have a place to go where they feel they have a safe space, an environment that they could connect and speak to each other? But it's just not enough to say, here's a room, here's some resources, I'm sure you all want to get to know each other. I think that's great and that's important, but we've actually provided them with some guiding principles. So what is it that this employee resource group can do for your community, for your employees? How are we going to invest? So our guiding principles are to make sure that they're connecting, which is really important, but also how are they serving the community? So our employee resource groups go out and they meet with uh, community partners, they'll do community service. They actually came to a panel here recently to talk about careers in healthcare. But also, how are we going to educate the rest of our population on what you identify as important to your group? So to give an example of this, we have our group, our More Voices of Color group. They have been partnering with our perinatal health equity group, right? We're looking at disparities in healthcare. How are we going to help that? We have an intergenerational group that's looking at policies and procedures 
for new employees. How are we transitioning an employee when they get to that place where they turn 26 and now they have to get their own health care? Making sure that our employees see that we're bringing them together for a reason because we want them to invest in our organization but also our community. And then there are other things like providing opportunities for storytelling. So we have a DEI council at South Coast and once a month we get together, there's 85 people invited from all different departments and positions and we invite um, our employees to do an identity share. And during that time, they actually talk about their own story. And so much of inclusion work is about creating that sense of belonging. Can I show up as my full self? Um, and I've been reading a lot of articles lately about do people need to show up as their full self? So I'm gonna change that to, do you show up as the version of yourself that you want people at work to know? Are we giving them that opportunity? And what I've found to be so powerful in the storytelling is you know, the nurse that you see walking around day to day sharing the story about the fact that she lost a child at one point. And when people ask her, how many children do you have? She doesn't necessarily know how to answer that. She's a great nurse and she's doing all of the things that she has to, but do we know that part about each other? Can she bring that to work? Or our, you know, an executive who has suffered through cancer and, and found that identity. We had an employee recently who showed us a video of her entire transition, um, which was happening in, in, in her life. These are things that are happening to people. Are we giving them the opportunity to tell their story? And are we creating those spaces? It can't be, I mean, I love our council meetings, um, but how many other spaces are we creating so that people can talk about these things, right? We talk about working parents. We talk about what is it like to be a veteran at work, uh, making sure that when they leave, they say, I did something, it mattered, um, I helped my community, but I also helped my employees understand my identity group. Thank you for that. Yeah. So uh, expanding on that topic, Gail, how can businesses create an inclusive environment, not only for their uh, employees, but also for their clients as well? Sure. Thank you, uh, President Douglas. And great to be here um, with the panel, and thank you to the Chamber for uh, collaborating with BCC to have this opportunity today. So I think there's many different ways that businesses can work to make an inclusive environment, but I first have to say that it is not easy. It is difficult and it is lifelong. It's not a one and done. And to really make that commitment, you have to have everyone, including the president, the owner, the top down leadership, and as well as bottom up. If there's not a true commitment to this work, it's, it's not gonna work. It's just gonna be a check off box. And I know we work with a lot of organizations called the YWCA, we come in, we do a lot of this work with boards and staffs and clients to discuss these issues. And I really feel strongly that if this is not a commitment, that there's resources behind it and there's support for the staff, for people that have the, the DEI role, whether, whatever the title might be called, because the ultimate mission is we can't not do this work for you. We can give you tools and resources, but there has to be that commitment. It has to be intentional. It has to be authentic. And you have to be ready for some uncomfortable conversations, and that's okay. That's okay to be open, to listen, and to hear what your staff is saying, what your clients might be saying. I'm such a big proponent and advocate. How do people feel when they walk in the door? Do they see representation? Do they see people that look like them? The pictures on the wall, the brochures that you're using, the media, every single thing makes people feel welcome or makes people want to walk away and not come back again. And as we all know, people talk. Mm -hmm. um, people will say, oh, don't go to this business or don't go to this store because I did not feel welcome and I, I turned and walked away. So really having that commitment is first and foremost really important. And it's ongoing training, even bringing someone in to do a workshop, again, it really has to be the groups, but the ultimate goal is most of these DEI groups, like with the chamber, my goal is a DEI group goes away. We do not have that committee anymore because it is ingrained in everything that we're doing. We're always thinking about that. And not just the people of color, the people from the groups that are represented or are not represented at the table are thinking about, that it's our allies that are also having the conversation, also talking about it. So really what it really means for DEIB, really to be inclusive, is building that trust, building that environment that people feel safe, that they feel that they are accepted no matter how they show up that day. Because as a woman of color, sometimes I have to think about that. How am I showing up today? And it's different depending on the group that I'm going to, who I'm talking with, if I'm with my friends, if I'm at home, if I'm at work, where am I I'm presenting? Those are things that we think about 
to it out, you know, speaking from my, my personal story. So it's really, really important that people feel that they can have those conversations and that you're coming up with those strategies that you're always changing, you're always looking at, whether it's media, social media, marketing, to make sure that your customers or your staff or your boards are feeling welcome. And having these conversations at every single meeting, I think, is really important as well. Thank you for that, Kiel. So building upon that, Artie, what makes people want to walk through the door of your business? That's a good question. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, what seems like a simple question really isn't. What makes each one of you welcome is different for everyone. What you want is for someone to walk in. We'll use a restaurant as an example because we're not looking for a niche business like a music store or something. Uh, but if you walked into a restaurant, what are you looking for? You're looking for a warm environment. You're looking for um, not to have people stare at you for whatever reason. You're looking for a warm, welcoming atmosphere so that you walk in and you feel like you're at home. I mean, not to plug restaurants, but as an example, the tipsy toboggan comes to mind. It feels like you're at home. Everyone's welcoming. Everybody's happy to see you. So what happens? You tend to want to go to places like that because it makes you feel good. Uh, just a little background on myself, I have a different perspective on everything because I've spent most of my life being someone that I didn't want to be and the last three years being someone that I actually am. And it's completely opened up the world for me all in a good way. And uh, I thank the Lord every day that I can live this way and not be uh, in other parts of the country. It's not the same way as it is here. People are persecuted, they're spit on, they're called names, they're fired from their jobs, they lose their spouses, their homes, uh, they lose everything. And for whatever reason, for whatever you are or are not, you shouldn't lose anything for that. You should be able to be who you are in this day and age without having someone judge you. And I think that's the whole goal to having a friendly environment is a place that you're not going to get judged, that you're going to get welcomed with open arms. Thank you for sharing that, Artie. Really appreciate that. So many of us are establishing diversity goals related to hiring people with disabilities. So Ross, what would you like employers to know about hiring individuals with disabilities? Th thank you, Laura. And uh, again, thank you for having me here today to talk about this. Um, I really want to talk about the uh, challenges of hiring a person with a disability, but then also the benefits of hiring someone with a disability. But to start with, I'd like to share some statistics. In March of 2024, the unemployment rate for the general population was 3.8%. The unemployment rate for people with a disability was 9.2%. And if you have, for those with developmental disabilities, the unemployment rate exceeded 70%. Workers with a disability were nearly twice as likely to work part-time and more likely to be self-employed than those without a disability. So what that means is there's a large untapped talent pool of people out there who want to work. So let me talk about some of the challenges and then the benefits of hiring from this pool. So some of the challenges that job seekers face include how one perceives oneself reflects an individual's personal understanding of their limitations or impairments. If a person has a negative perception of themselves, it affects their confidence and willingness to work. Two, lack of education or training impacts on the ability for a person to do the job. Access to quality education and relevant vocational training is essential for skill development and employability. Another challenge that people with disabilities face is transportation. Limited access to reliable transportation can hinder one's ability to commute to work or attend job interviews. Four, approximately 10% of respondents to a Department of Labor survey identified that the need for special features at the job was seen as a barrier. These features could include workplace, workplace accommodations, assistive technologies, or modifications to the work environment. Five, unfortunately, people with negative attitudes towards employing people with disabilities or people who are different still persist today, leading to discrimination and limited opportunities. Overcoming these biases is essential for fostering inclusivity in the workplace. 
six. Lack of accessibility in the workplace can be a significant barrier and challenge. Physical accessibility such as ramps, elevators, and accessible restrooms, and digital accessibility, websites, software, and communication tools are critical for equal participation. Seven, people with disabilities may encounter fewer job openings tailored to their abilities and needs. Individuals with cognitive challenges are often pigeonholed into the more stereotyped kinds of jobs such as bagging supermarkets, janitorial work, fast food jobs and factory work. Now these are all sort of noble uh, vocations, but the reality is that there are thousands of other jobs out there that people with disabilities can do if given the chance. Creating more diverse and inclusive job opportunities is essential. So what can the employers do? and the business community do to make this easier. The social stigma associated with disabilities can lead to exclusion, isolation, and reluctance by employers to hire individuals. Raising awareness and promoting understanding can help combat this barrier. Ensuring that in individuals receive on-the-job training skills relevant to their abilities and interests is crucial. A mismatch between skills and job requirements can hinder employment success. Addressing these barriers requires collaborative efforts from employers, policymakers, and the community as a whole. By fostering an inclusive environment and providing necessary support, we can create more equitable employment opportunities for all people. And finally, I want to talk about some of the benefits of hiring a person with a disability. One, by hiring individuals, you tap into a vast, untapped talent pool. These workers bring unique skills and experiences that can give your business a competitive edge. Two, embracing diversity contributes to a richer and more inclusive com company culture. When you create an environment where everyone feels valued and respected, it fosters collaboration and creativity. Disability is an essential component of workplace diversity. By actively hiring people with disabilities, you create a more equitable and accessible work environment for all the employees. Three, companies that actively hire and support people with disabilities demonstrate their commitment to social responsibility. This positive reputa reputation can attract both customers and potential employees who align with your values. Four, employees with disabilities tend to exhibit strong loyalty and commitment. By providing a supportive workplace, you can reduce turnover rates and retain valuable talent. And finally, there are federal and state tax incentives and other resources specifically designed to encourage hiring people with disabilities. These incentives can offset costs associated with accommodations and demonstrate your commitment to diversity and inclusion. Embracing disability as part of your company's diversity strategy not only benefits the individual, but also strengthens your business and the community as a whole. And now I'd just like to give a little plug for Macy. Uh, Paul Career is here. He is the director of the Macy Initiative. Uh, and as Laura said, it's one of those human service acronyms that stands for Massachusetts Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Initiative. And we help prepare students with significant developmental disabilities and autism over the age of 18 who otherwise would not have the opportunity to go to Bristol to take classes that are connected to the career goals and to better prepare them for the workforce. Here at Bristol, students take a range of classes, including animal care, culinary arts, theater, television production, just to name a few. And this summer, we're starting an exciting employment initiative, working with a small number of students who are looking for paid summer employment. Each student, will receive the support of a coach and in a job that matches their likes, interests and strengths. So certainly if you'd like to be involved, uh, myself and Paul will be here afterwards and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you further. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Ross. And full disclosure, my office uh, has an intern right now. Uh, his name is Riley. He's doing a great job. And I want to thank um, my, uh, my uh, office mate, Lucinda, in the back. She's done a great job in welcoming him and his coach. And um, uh, we hope that other people across the area will take on uh, students. And uh, please see Ross or Paul. Paul, you might want to raise your hand uh, if you're interested in taking one of our trainees and helping
helping them move ahead uh, with their careers. It's really a worthwhile program, and I can tell you that um, it means so much to the rest of us and opens up our eyes to so many new possibilities. So thank you for that work. So Helena, what are some of the challenges related to administrating um, or administering uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging programs? And maybe you could give us some examples of the work that you're doing at Bay Coast. Sure. Good afternoon. And thank you again for this opportunity, Laura. Greatly appreciate it. Some of the challenges, I would say overall, can be pushback or resistance from time to time. You know, the fear of change and the lack of understanding of the importance and benefits of DEIB initiatives and efforts. Uh, limited resources, funding, time and personnel are all very necessary uh, for successful implementation of DEIB programs. Um, this can impact the scope and effectiveness of the initiatives and also measuring the impact. Um, organizations may struggle to define relevant metrics um, collect accurate data from time to time, and interpret these results, making it difficult to track progress and demonstrate the rate of return. And then lastly, sustainability and integration. DEIB efforts uh, should be integrated in all aspects of an organization's culture, policies, and procedures. However, sustaining momentum and embedding DEIB principles into everyday practices and operations can be challenging, especially amid competitive um, priorities and challenging dynamics. So what we have done at Bay Coast Bank is really take the opportunity as, um, I will say for myself as a DI officer, and really get out there and really get to know and see each employee, each individual, have one-on-one -on -one conversations um, from the bottom up, really get an understanding of what their beliefs are of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. What's important to them? Um, what are some of the wins that they observe throughout their the tenure at Bay Coast Bank? And then what continues to be some challenges and how I can collaborate with those teams, with those departments to implement those items that are important. Um, employee resource groups that we mentioned. Uh, one that I'm very proud of is Voice of the Associate that will be rolling out actually next month. Voice of the Associate is a group of individuals that are welcome to join a round table on a quarterly basis. Each and every employee has an opportunity to attend a lunch and learn with a community leader, a nonprofit, a business owner. Not only do they have a seat at the table, but most importantly, they have a voice to share some feedback, some perspectives, some ideas, and then also get a better understanding um, of what the needs of the community are. And that's something I'm very excited to, to roll out. So I may be tapping a few of you on the shoulders. Uh, you may be receiving an invite. But that's something that we've done at Bay Coast. Can I ask you what some of the metrics are that you're using at Bay Coast Bank in terms of measuring the effects of your uh, DEIB programming? Uh, one recently that I've done was an employee, uh, an employee appreciation event. Mm -hmm. and. Um, in the past two years, we have an employee base of a little over 500, give or take. And the previous years, we had a little bit of between about 200 semi-employees attend this event each year. Last year, we had a 35% increase nice. of attendance, which was fantastic. It was around the world at Bay Coast Bank where we celebrated different cultures with food trucks. Mm -hmm. If you have food, they will come. <laughs> <laughs> and I also invited stakeholders such as our board members and corporators to bridge that gap, mm -hmm. to put a name to a face, to shake a hand with a fellow board member, to not be intimidated, but also to build those relationships with those individuals that are part of the decision making for Bay Coast Bank. Great. Thank you for answering that question. I appreciate your work. So Emmanuel, how do we best connect DEI initiatives to our HR operations? Well, I, I think we're hearing a trend in a lot of the responses, right, in that uh, things have to be sustainable for them to be effective and live beyond their name. Uh, for those of you who were in the innovation sector in the, in the 2010s, I was a chief innovation officer, and very similar to, to what you said, Gail, I was thinking about how to make the word innovation obsolete in my organization. And if I could change the culture, to be process improvement focused for every job function, 
I had achieved that and my department was no longer necessary as a standalone function. We could be integrated into anything. And I feel similar about the DEIB work, right? A lot of initiatives take names that are popular for a short while, and we've all seen this in our careers. They come back again in a different format with a different name and different branding, but essentially they are the same thing as what once existed before. What makes DEIB unique and special is that it's an acknowledgement where culture and operations for the first time are blending. And now that at that intersection, your HR departments are probably the easiest places to start implementing DEIB work because they govern hiring practices, they govern compensation, they govern benefits, they govern policy creation in many environments, and they also govern a lot of statistics. Your HR departments are probably one of the most statistic rich departments that are largely untapped. And they have a lot of metrics that you could look at, like cents on the dollar between different races, ethnicities, genders, right? There's all this data that can show you where your inequities lie. What I would really suggest is if you haven't started, start looking at what your data tells you. What are some of the structural issues that you can identify? Primarily around hiring and compensation because as we talked about feeling welcome, you're gonna feel welcome where people look like you. If there's an intention to hire people of diverse backgrounds, to promote people of diverse backgrounds and to empower them to make decisions, to, be, to actually be part of the table, not just a symbol or a token, you will get the most out of them. Your businesses will flourish because they'll bring all of their perspectives to the table. And I think that HR is, is often a, a great place to start. As to how you can do this specifically, you know, one project that, that I've really liked at Bristol is looking at the compensation structure that we had. I joined Bristol about a year and five months ago now, and one of the first things that I, that I dove into was equity data. What are different demographics are compensated like? What are different genders are compensated like? And what we identified is that we had a lot of similar positions with inconsistency in how they were being compensated. So we did a salary study, we did a compensation study, we implemented a new compensation process, we put folks on a paid grade grid for the first time ever here, and it's showing some success because regardless of where you are a director, an assistant director, a VP, an associate VP, you're on the same compensation path. There are things that account for the size of departments and the expertise required to get into a position, but these are now more predictable and therefore more transparent. And if you really want to show what you're prioritizing, transparency is key. Talking about what are some of the equity gaps that you've identified, how you're addressing them, why you've chosen that specific set of strategies or interventions, or why you're prioritizing these initiatives over others, not only makes the programs themselves more valuable, but it increases stakeholdership from all different levels of, of decision making. And that's somewhere where your, whether you call it your people office, your human capital office, or your HR function, can really take center stage in, in providing strat strategic level support, but also analytical support to expose some of those challenges. Thank you. And so many of our H officer, HR offices also are responsible for training and professional development. So I'm going to ask Gail, who has done a lot of work in this space here in the, ones, in the One South Coast Chamber region, to talk about the types of training and professional development that's needed to help an organization to become more welcoming. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Well, there's so many different opportunities um, that are available, and it depends on the organization and the needs. I mean, you know, like Helena said, resources um, and what the organization can commit to can help drive that. But really having the staff and your employees have some involvement. So starting off with those surveys and seeing where people are at. When you mentioned metrics, we, I know when we teach a lot of these classes, we always do a pre-test, mm -hmm. post-test to see where, where people are coming from. What are, what are they thinking? What are, what are the myths and the biases? We all have them, every single person in this room. 
has what they call implicit and explicit biases. When someone walks in the door and you meet them, you automatically make a judgment. It's, you just can't help yourself. Everyone, everyone does that. And it's okay. It's okay to acknowledge that. It's okay. To, that's the first step is your personal growth. And as an employee sitting there, I facilitated many where you can see there are people that don't want to be there. They want to be any place else, whether they're uncomfortable or they don't want to have the conversation or they're uncomfortable with what someone said or maybe they hurt someone's feelings. And it's okay for the person to say, like with the story that you told about the nurse, because we don't know. So sometimes we might say things that might offend someone or might upset someone. You know, and we talk a lot, especially when we work with our children, about saying the word ouch. And what does that ouch mean? It means what you said upset me or hurt my feelings or maybe you didn't understand and we have a conversation about it. We try not to be, you know, not confrontational, but really just having that understanding. So that personal step is always that first piece and that's, that's ongoing to do that. We've done work with you, with, you, mm -hmm. with BCC at, at the chamber and having people come in and facilitate those conversations because a lot of times it is better to have an outside person coming in. Sometimes it's hard for the staff to be able to do that or the owner of the business to be able to do those conversations. I mean, even myself as well. It's, you know, you're always going to different trainings, meet, meeting different people, reading books, looking at different webinars. Um, you can listen to podcasts. There's so many different things that you can come up with personally that you can do, and you can share those resources with your businesses and organizations. And then if you have a consultant or if you have a staff person or you're bringing someone in to work with your organization and having that plan as we said, to really make it intentional, really internalize that to see where does your organization or your business want to be over the next year, six months, two years, three years, and how are we going to get there and what resources do we need to make that happen? And a lot of times, right, right now we're doing work with several that, that the board is fairly, I'll say, middle-aged white men. And they're coming like, oh, well, how do we do this? And it's, well, we're not going to kick everybody off the board. That's not the first step. <laughs> it's, it's really looking at, well, why do you want to do this? We don't want to have the token person. You know, being, is it representative of the organization that you're representing? If you're working with people with disabilities, do you have someone with disabilities on your board? And it can't just be one person as well. So it's really thinking about your recruitment strategies and then how you're making them feel welcoming, your onboarding, and how do you maintain? because that's what I hear a lot from people from diverse backgrounds that go on to work at organizations or be part of a board is they leave because everything's great in the beginning and everyone's getting a lot of attention and a lot of resources and then nothing happens afterwards and they don't feel welcome and they don't feel included. So by having that consistent professional development and it's in your personal work plan as well. With all of our employees, it's, it's in the plan. It's on the agenda at every board meeting, staff meeting, staff retreat and we take turns, it's not just me that does it. Yeah, every board member leads a session about that. Every staff member leads that. So we're having these different conversations because everybody brings something different and having their voices heard is really important. And for us as a human service agency, talking about the clients, talking about the participants that we're working with on an everyday basis that are facing you know, discrimination in so many different efforts, and some of it is intersectional. They might be a person of color, they have a disability, they're low income, they're homeless. They have substance abuse, so they have four or five different things, and their face and doors are closing on them in every step of the way. So it's really, again, having the conversation so that we can represent them the best that we can if we need to advocate. So there's so many things that you can do, and it can be overwhelming, mm -hmm. for sure, and that can be a reason to not do it. It's just really having a plan and say, okay, we're gonna work on this right now, and then we're gonna work on this, and having groups, and then having the support. I can't stress enough is having the support from the, the management or the president for this is, is really, really important. I appreciate that, yeah. And there really are, can be some uncomfortable conversations, but they're so important they're to so have important. in a proactive mm -hmm. manner, so thank you for sharing that. So Melanie, how can we connect diverse populations through the employee recruitment process? So I feel like I'm going to echo so much of what everyone said because I completely agree. And also with all the names, I would like to make a t-shirt someday of like diversity star, diversity champion, cultural competency champion, all the different names that we've had. Um, but it just goes to show that this takes intention and time and work. So when we're thinking about connecting um, our recruitment, right, we want to make sure that we're casting the widest net. How are we making sure that we have all of the talented, you know, right now we have, we're in the middle of a talent shortage, right? So how are we getting the best person for this job? And you really have to be intentional. So looking at affinity groups, if you really want to be intentional, you can go out and find there is a Latinas in tech group 
are you posting there? There are you know, veteran accountants. There are black physicians um, in New England. Are you posting at these places? Are you committing the resources in terms of the cost to post them in different places? Are you consistently being in spaces where the people that you are trying to hire want to be at? So this means not just going one time. I recently went to a conference and they were talking about historically black colleges and universities. And you know everybody was like, oh, we want to go there. That's where we want to hire. So you can't go there one time <laughs> and set up your table and your tablecloth and say, we're committed. Right? They're going to, they're, they want to go to the companies that are consistently in these spaces, that are sh truly showing a commitment. We're not going to solve this in a day. Anyone that's been to a DEI training that I've done, I always start by saying, I promise you in the hour, I'm not going to solve racism. I'm not going to solve homophobia. I, I'm not, that's just, I can't do it in the hour. But I can create a space for the next hour that we can talk about this. And that's all you can do. So really, it's showing that commitment when you're recruiting um, to where you're posting. What are you looking for? How are you training to tie in the training and development piece? How are you training your hiring managers? Are they aware of the bias that comes when you look at a resume? Do they know that maybe an easier way to start off by eliminating some bias is a phone screen if you're talking to someone? Um, you know, we talk about when you're hiring someone, so many of us have been taught in HR and hiring managers, like you're looking for that person that's sitting straight up and making eye contact and, and speaking in a certain way. And are they, you know, do they show motivation? Like all of us in HR are shaking our head. Like we, we've been taught these things are important. Do you really need someone to make eye contact in their interview when they're on a Zoom screen if they're doing data entry? Is that the skill set that you're looking for at that very moment? Is that the most important one? Maybe it's one that you'd like, right? We always have those lists in HR of things that we really want and then the preferred category. Uh, but are you training your hiring managers to make sure that they're looking for the skill set that they need and not for these other things that we've been you know, taught or like even just, we don't even realize we're looking for. Do they know about affinity bias? You know, when we're hiring um, individuals, it is so easy to look at a resume and go, oh, they're from my neighborhood and they went to the same college as me. Of course, I'm going to like, you know, definitely, that's the yes pile. I have no idea where this person studied. I don't know where they live. I'm not really sure. Uh, maybe. Like, do people take the time to train our hiring managers on the fact that you're doing it intentionally or not? People do jump to conclusions very, very quickly. I used to do a, a training where you could show a picture of a person and I would say, what kind of car do you think they drive? And almost everyone thought they figured it, like they were like, I thought of a car. Like, think about how quickly we're making those judgments. Are we, are we training our hiring managers to be aware of these kind of biases? And then also to echo the importance of retention. So there's so much focus on hiring this diverse pool of candidates. Everyone wants to go out now and make sure we're going to all these different spaces. It does not help you to spend time, money, and energy to hire the most talented person so that they can come to your organization and then be the only one in the room, or be misunderstood, or not have the same expectations as others. So making sure that you're just as intentional about your retention efforts is really, really important. Do people understand microaggressions? Are we having those conversations? Um, are you really, really going back to those job fairs in the same places? And then partnerships. You don't have to actually do it alone. There's so many agencies that can help you with this. At South Coast, we recently um, partnered with the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Coalition, mm -hmm. and they will send resumes to you, <laughs> which is great for an HR person. Every day, they're sending us different resumes of um, employees who identify as employees with disabilities. And this is a huge pool, as we mentioned, that is ready to work. Mm -hmm. you know, we have hundreds of positions open. Why are we not looking at this population, so when they send us resumes, and they're helping us with some of the accommodations. Some of them are really, really easy things that we can do. Um, and then it gives us an opportunity to train our hiring managers as well. As long as we're working on different positions at different places and making sure that they feel welcome when they come, you can connect your recruitment to build that sense of belonging and to cast the widest net. Great, wonderful advice. Thanks for that, Melanie. So, we're going to touch on another conundrum in this space, and that is how can we best support those in DEI leadership roles and create safe spaces for them? We know the work is hard, and we know that uh, turnover is particularly high in these roles as well. So Helena and Artie, would you like to answer this question? Sure. 
So as individuals in DEI work, we're often creating safe spaces for everyone else. But what are we doing for ourselves? So I believe to begin with, we certainly should encourage open and honest communication amongst each other. Um, create spaces where we feel comfortable in discussing our challenges, our setbacks, um, and our vulnerabilities without the fear of judgment from each other. Uh, by creating spaces where we're able to have honest dialogue, uh, again, for genuine problem solving and mutual support just creates a more, um, a, more a better place for us just to really be, uh, feel supported by each other. Uh, and again, by that support, providing resources, tools, a shoulder to tap on from time to time when you're having a challenge. And then sharing best practices and resources is key. Um, don't assume that your fellow DEI partner has the same access to tools and resources as you do. Where you may have a challenge, they may have a strength, and vice versa. So I think it's really important to just collectively come together and encourage, encourage collaboration amongst peers. Um, that is one way I do find um, a way that we can create safe spaces for each other. I, I think what's really important is to be honest about yourself to everyone first. Uh, no one judges you better than you do. Uh, anyone in the room here, you're, who's your worst critic? It's you. Um, so if you don't want other people to critique you, just put it all on the table. Uh, and I think the goal of a lot of these committees is just to find out what the, the hot spots are, what the pressure points are, and see if we can deal with it. I was on one of the meetings and someone said, so what is the goal of this DEI committee? And I guess the goal of the committee is to not need a committee. If everyone was compliant and people didn't judge each other and you could go anywhere you want and do and say everything you wanted, we wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't have all these DEI committees in the chamber and Rotary and every other organization uh, because people would be acceptant of everyone else, but unfortunately we are not. And as they were saying, uh, we have biases that we don't even realize, right? You walk into a fast food store and you see some young girl behind the counter, what's the first thing you think? She's too young, she's gonna screw up the order. You're already judging. Uh, a lot of, I mean, you can name a lot of other places. You go in and you see someone and you first think, why is this person working at the car wash? Aren't they smart enough to do something else? That's not the point. The point is that's what they want to do. It may be all that they can do physically and mentally, but the important thing is that they're doing something. And I think if we just learn to accept everyone for whatever they can do or whatever they can't do, uh, then we'd be in a lot better position. Thank you both for those answers. It's, it's a, it's a tif difficult job, and um, we certainly want to make sure that we support all of our DEI leaders. So how might we join force forces to elevate our DEI work across the South Coast? And how can sharing resources and building partnerships with other organizations further our DEI work? And I've asked Melanie, Artie, and Helena if they would take a stab at answering this question. Would ever like to go first? I can start. Okay. Um, I think events like this are great. I think having the opportunity to meet other people and then uh, really being committed to sharing resources, right? And you find someone that's a great speaker, that's a great presenter, how are we connecting them to another agency? We really don't have to do the work alone, right? So we try to look at all of the different agencies around us and the work that they're doing and how can we bring them into our community? And then also, are we bringing our employees out to their community. So, um, for example, we've been doing some work with perinatal health equity. We've been working with Sacred Birthing Village. We're going out to um, Fall River. Our providers and our care navigators went to their space. It was great. We had a tea. We talked to the doulas. We talked to them about what can we do in our hospital to make you feel more comfortable. That's an easier conversation to have when we're in their space. A few months later, we actually brought them into the hospital, which was great. They came in, they met our providers, they met our doctors, they sat in the rooms, they sat in the labor and delivery rooms, they got to meet our nurses, right? And we talked about how can we serve you better when you're here, when you're a doula and you're with a, a patient here. 
So it shows a commitment. It would be really easy to say, you know, I'm going to call them and I'm going to have them come and, and do a lunch and learn for an hour and tell us all about the great work that they're doing. And that is helpful, and that's great. That's one piece of it. But are you really looking at your clients? Are you really looking at your customers, your patients, um, and making sure that you're connecting to the industry? We had a speaker come in to speak on the fisherman community and health disparities for that specific group, right? I'm using New Bedford and, and Fall River myself, but that's a huge part, part of our community. Are we providing the best health care for the fisherman community, and why not have somebody who represents them come and talk to us as an organization? instead of you know, reading something about it or looking. So making sure that you're connecting, and this doesn't matter what industry you're in, like I'm, I'm newer to healthcare, I used to work in higher ed. It's great that we had all these DEI efforts when we were recruiting for you know, faculty and staff, but are we looking at our curriculum? Are we looking at what the students want? Are we supporting our students once they get on our campus? It's the same exact idea. No matter what industry you're in, creating those connections with your community, finding out what people really want, and then finding a way to join them and have them come in, I, I think that's how you create that collective, inclusive environment that people are looking for. And it takes time, right? None of this is gonna happen overnight, so being as intentional as possible, as often as possible, and as many touch points as possible is really gonna make that difference. Thanks for that, Melanie. Everything Melanie said. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. Uh, forming collaborative networks, exchanging resources and expertise, but most importantly, in addition to all of that, is creating long-term relationship building. It's not just a touch and go. It's about sustaining those relationships, showing up, investing in, in building long-term relationships with partner organizations based on trust, mutual respect and shared values, regular communication and collaboration, and evaluation to ensure that our partnership remains dynamic and responsive to evolving the needs and challenges of our communities and of each other. Um, by nurturing these relationships, we can sustain our collective efforts to advance DI across the South Coast. In summary, by joining these forces and sharing resources through strategic partnerships, we can strengthen our DI work, amplify our impact, and create lasting change across the South Coast region. Well, try following that. Um, <laughs> you know, as the saying goes, it takes a village. By getting together with other groups, I work with so many different committees, you pick up bits and pieces from everyone. Um, everyone in this room can look at something and have a different opinion. Uh, that's what makes us all different. Diversity isn't all about the people that are different. The diversity about everybody. Uh, just because you're not one of these classifications doesn't mean you're not diverse. We're all different. We all think differently. We act differently. And I think if you absorb what everybody has to offer and like take out bits and pieces and make it your own, I think it makes things a lot easier uh, when you're working with people of diverse nature. Thank you, and for everyone's convenience today, we do have a handout with our panelists' uh, names and their contact information, so uh, maybe we can all start to join forces and share resources together. So we wanted to make sure that we uh, begin to build on those resources here in the South Coast. So our closing question is for Gail Fort. So what is the Chamber's DEI committee working to achieve? And how can we as a community of South Coast businesses and organizations support this important work? Okay. Well, thank you. Well, we've had a, done a lot of work in the last uh, few years, and we know there's so much more uh, to be done. I think the first thing we did was we recognized that, you know, we weren't doing a great job. We weren't as diverse as we could be and needed to be, and we weren't representative of our community. So we had to do that introspection, that look, those hard questions, look at the businesses and why are they not coming? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, the model for some is might be old or antiquated or again not feeling welcome. So we had to look at, as Helena said, what are the different touch points? How do we do different things? Who are we partnering with? Who are we collaborating with? Looking again at the, the somber certifications as an example, we did a workshop on that and letting people know what it 
it is, and it's not easy to get the certification, but many vendors, I know we're one of those vendors, people come knocking on the door all the time, that we need someone that's a minority owned or women owned business, especially if you're doing government contracts or government work or, or businesses. So looking at that, looking at our vendors, looking at our businesses, again, doing that look. We all do the same thing. I know we do it too. You call the same caterer, you call the same printing company, you call the same whomever. So how do you expand that network when you're looking for services, when you're putting out an RFP for you know, a new copy machine or a new phone vendor? Let's, let's really look at that list. Is it representative of the community? I know one of the things, I don't want to put Mike on the spot, but Mike did with some other staff is walk up and down to Christian Avenue in New Bedford. There are so many new businesses there. And that was something that we discussed that this flyer or this, that's not going to work. You have to go in, you have to speak, you have to sometimes know the language, you have to visit and let them know about the chamber and let them know about the resources. So just giving them a free membership would be great and then they don't show up anymore. It's that calls, those phone calls that some of the board members and committee members calling, hey, we're having this event, why don't you come with me, I'll meet you there. Come and see what it's all about. You know, we had two great events, and this year was even better than last year. And it was so diverse, and so many people were there. And bringing, you know, we had big businesses like South Coast and Bay Coast, bringing so many staff members, people that probably never even get invited to go to things like this, because it's usually the, the top people that come to events like this. So bringing other people so that they can network, as well as the small businesses. I know my, myself, the first time at a chamber event, I didn't know anybody very quiet and was maybe one of two people of color in the room and one of maybe a handful of women there you know too and was fairly young at the time you know to go to something so you have like three things that you're thinking about and you feel nervous and oh, I don't know if I want to come back to this or not but it took somebody coming up to me talking to me hey who are you and just having that conversation switching cards and they followed up so that's something that we all can do together when we're coming to events, whether it's chamber events or other things that you're doing at your business, to just be welcoming. Just picture yourself if you were that person, you know, walking into the room and you didn't know anybody. Everybody does that. You always look around the room and you sit, you know, just like in school, you go and sit with your friends or you go and sit with the people that you know. Sometimes sit with somebody else. So hopefully today, everybody will do that as we network, go and talk, introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know and exchange business cards or numbers and have some conversations. Because we know that we can all do this. We can do this together, as Addie said. It's not just one person. This is a whole group effort to be able to continue to this work. And hopefully, you'll all join us on this journey. Well, thank you for that uh, closing question, Gail. And thank you to all of our panelists, Artie, Helena, Ross, Gail, Emmanuel, and Melanie. Um, I want to thank you so much for lending your expertise today. Um, and I hope that during the reception in, in a more informal setting that you'll maybe tap them on the shoulders and, and continue the conversations and really dig into their expertise. I also hope that you will challenge yourself, like Gail said, to meet some new people today and maybe further the conversations that we've had today asking some of the same questions how do we strengthen this work across the south coast how do we learn from each other and how do we support our diversity equity and inclusion leaders uh, in this work because it is hard and I know that sometimes you do feel like you're on an island and uh, we want to be supportive of this important work and also uh, if you're so inclined and you're not a part of the chamber maybe you uh, talk to Mike um, or Ian or uh, Katie or some of our other chamber representatives or some of us who are wearing our one South Coast chamber name tags maybe you talk to them about how you can become involved in the chamber and in our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, committee, which is really working hard in this space, and, and we've really accomplished some great things. So I, I want to thank the chamber for uh, being a partner and a collaborator in this work and also helping us today. So I uh, ask you all if you would just give a big, warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.